Information is everywhere and is contained in everything. It exists outside of time and space because it forms everything, including time and space. From Alatra by Anastasia Novich. A rare person looking at freely soaring birds wouldn't dream of being able to fly, just to jump and start flying. Unfortunately, most people can't fly. But why? Yes, it's kaleidoscope of fact, and today we will delve into this issue. As we all know well, the main obstacle to human free flight is the force that modern science calls gravity. Yes, gravity is a fundamental force that chains us to the surface of the planet. But gravity not only affects objects on the surface of the Earth, but it also keeps our planet in its orbit around the Sun and causes the solar system to revolve around the center of the galaxy and the galaxy to rotate around the center of a cluster of galaxies. Thus, the entire universe is held in its state by the forces of gravity. Throughout history, scientists and inventors have been seeking ways to overcome it. As of today, a huge number of aircraft have been created that use the lifting power of wings to fly. But the holy grail of all ways to overcome Earth's gravity is indeed anti-gravity. In simpler terms, to take off in conditions where gravity is cancelled, you won't need wings, propellers or jet stream, you'll just fly. The question is only in the conditions that cancel the effect of gravity. How to create them? Our team of searchers asked this question and today we are going to share with you the results of several months of intense search for answers. Franco Vazza, an astrophysicist from the University of Bologna and Alberto Filetti, a neurosurgeon from the University of Verona, investigated the similarities between two of the most complex systems in nature, the cosmic network of galaxies and the network of neuronal cells in the human brain. The human brain functions thanks to its wide neural network, which contains up to 100 billion neurons. On the other hand, the observable universe is composed of a cosmic web of at least 100 billion galaxies. Take a look at these pictures. In the left one, we see a section of cerebellum with magnification factor 40 times, obtained with electron microscopy by Dr. E. Zunarelli, University Hospital of Modena. While on the right, there is a section of a cosmological simulation of the universe with an extension of 300 million light years on each side. They look similar, don't they? The researchers concluded that probably the connectivity within the two networks, neuronal and cosmic, evolves following similar physical principles, despite the striking difference between the scales of galaxies and neurons. In other words, everything in the world is fractally repeated. We know that galaxies form a network structure due to the force of gravity. Judging by the photos, neurons in the brain are subject to a similar force but in different conditions. The range of the scale of the action of this force is striking, from the size of the universe to the neural network in our brain. But a reasonable question arises. If this force manifests itself in a person, can it be controlled? You might say, it is nonsense. How can a human control gravity? It's unscientific. Don't rush to answer. Facts are stubborn things. History has preserved credible cases that will turn your understanding of this phenomenon upside down.
17th century, Giuseppe from Cupertino, also known as Joseph of Cupertino. Joseph's astonishing ability to fly manifested when he was 25 years old after he was accepted into the Franciscan order and became a priest. This ability remained with him throughout his life. The future saint would levitate both inside the church during the worship service and in the open air. He would rise above the ground, hovering at heights ranging from 10 centimeters to 70 meters, staying in the air for dozens of minutes. 19th century. The next to be seen in flight was Daniel Douglas Hume, 1833 to 1886. What brought Hume sensational fame was his levitation sessions. Sir William Crookes claimed that about 50 times he witnessed how the medium's body rose to a height of about 2 meters from the floor in good lighting. When Hume floated in the air, I ran my hands around his body in search of invisible ropes or cords that could lift and hold him in such a position, but found nothing. Several times I observed Hume arising along with the chair he was sitting on. Much less often, but it also happened that people sitting nearby would also levitate with Hume, writes Crookes. In 1868, in the presence of witnesses, Hume demonstrated an astonishing levitation session, during which he floated out of the third floor bedroom window and flew back into the wide open window of the neighboring living room, covering a distance of about 20 meters above the street. One of those present at the levitation demonstration was the poet Alexei Konstantinovich Tolstoy, who described the effect as something incredible. He wrote, Hume floated up into the air. While he was levitating above us, I could grasp his legs. Hume always conducted himself in an exceptionally humble manner and spoke of his abilities solely as a gift bestowed from above. I have these powers. I shall be happy up to the limit of my strength to demonstrate them to you. If you approach me as one gentleman should approach another, I shall be glad if you can throw any further light upon them. I will lend myself to any reasonable experiment. I have no control over them. They use me, but I do not use them. They desert me for months and then come back in redoubled force. I am a passive instrument, no more. Hume levitated in daylight. His abilities were examined by independent experts and renowned scientists of the 19th century. Oliver Lodge, William Barrett, Cesare Lombroso. We have presented just two examples of this highly unusual phenomenon, spontaneous anti-gravity. The very existence of such a phenomenon completely overturns our understanding of humans and the laws of physics known to us. And don't think that such phenomenon is a long forgotten past. You can also find mentions of modern manifestations of spontaneous anti-gravity in people. The question is different. If this ability is dormant in each of us, then it can be controlled. We just need to understand the conditions under which it manifests. What are these conditions? Edgar Cayce was a world-famous clairvoyant and medium. In a hypnotic trance-like state, Cayce mentioned acoustic levitation, the ability to move heavy objects using sound and mental energy a technique recorded on ancient Sumerian clay tablets. Historians read on these tablets that sound can lift stones. Perhaps something similar was used during the construction of the Egyptian pyramids. Casey mentioned that the builders of temple structures in Atlantis would hold each other's hands and, to the beat of drums, begin to dance in a circle around a massive stone loudly singing ritual songs. The mental focus and intention of many people, together with the energy of sound vibrations, lifted multi-ton stone blocks and placed them where needed. The medium's messages are not the most reliable source of information. 
But it is something. At least we have a direction to explore. Sound resonance and everything related to it. Surfing the internet, we found several more pieces of evidence that strengthened the hypothesis suggested by Casey. Gravity is somehow related to the phenomena of resonance. In other words, we are talking about the situation where sound waves add up in the same phase. However, there is another condition besides resonance, and not everyone knows about this condition. In the American city of Homestead, situated at the southeastern tip of the Florida peninsula, there is an amazing architectural ensemble. What makes it so unique is that it represents an extensive and intricate complex of numerous residential and utility structures, along with various decorative constructions, including sculptures and sculptural groups, all crafted from a single material, oolithic limestone. After buying a 40-acre piece of land in Florida City, Edward Leedskalnin set out on a remarkable construction project. He dedicated the structure he conceived to the bride who had rejected him and called it a monument for his sweet 16. In 1936, Ed decided to move to another place. He bought a considerably larger and upland piece of land of 400 acres near Homestead, a few miles from his former residence. After this, he faced the task of how to move several hundred tons of stone structures and works of art to a new location. Ed borrowed a tractor with a trailer from a neighbor and spent several months loading his creations into it at night. During the day, he would transport them to the new location and unload them the next night. No one ever saw how he placed them on the trailer and took them off. Initially, Ed called his new property the Rock Gate Park, but later changed its name to the Coral Castle. It was this name that entered the legend of Edward Leedskalnin. It took Ed 25 years of his life to construct the entire complex of buildings and sculptural ensembles of the castle, with a total weight exceeding 1,100 tons. A year after Ed's death in 1952, the intrigued American Society of Engineers set out to debunk the castle's builder's deception. They rented the most powerful bulldozer and tried to move one of the blocks that Edward hadn't used in the construction. Their efforts proved to be in vain. The mystery behind the castle's construction remains unsolved. There are no longer any eyewitnesses to the building process. Moreover, due to his unsociable demeanor and asceticism, Ed didn't permit anyone access to his creation, earning him the nickname Sullen Ed. In order to study the phenomenon of the castle, they once tried to remove a multi-ton revolving door at the entrance. It was so perfectly balanced that even a child could open it with the push of a finger. Dismantling the door required an incredibly powerful lifting crane and several dozens of workers. The door was removed, however, it turned out that it had been centered and balanced by nothing more than a rusty truck bearing, which immediately crumbled due to its age. To set the door back to its place, the top engineers and modern technology were needed. According to the recollections of some elderly Americans who were young boys at the time, the coral blocks at Ed's construction site would fly through the air like toys. Quite recently, an unusual device was found in the center of the castle, eventually identified by scientists as a direct current generator. It was a massive construction composed of numerous metallic components, featuring the star of David in the middle. On the exterior of the device, 240 permanent horseshoe-shaped magnets were embedded. The master himself lived in a 10-meter room, now functioning as a small museum displaying Edward's simple work tools. Presently, the castle has attained the status of a Florida State Heritage Site and transformed into a museum. In 1984, by decision of the U.S. government, the Coral Castle was included in the National Register of Historic Places of the Country.
Unfortunately, after his death, Litz Kanin left no records revealing the secret of the construction. The only thing found in his room was a notebook with calculations. However, these notes more closely resemble a schoolboy's drafts than an engineer's calculations. That's what those who personally saw these notes say. Indirect evidence and a few testimonies from neighbors suggest that Litz Kanin used sound levitation, creating specific conditions for it. Of all Litz Kanin's legacy, his words are the greatest value for us. Every form of existence, whether it be rock, tree or animal, has a beginning and an end. But the three things that all matter is constructed from has no beginning and no end. They are the North and South Poles, individual magnets, and the neutral particles of matter. These three different things are the construction blocks of everything. Perhaps with this statement, Ed wanted to express a hypothesis that today has gained many followers both among researchers of paranormal phenomena and among respected scientists. This idea suggests that our planet is surrounded by a network of invisible force lines whose coordinates can be expressed through mathematical equations. Studies show that the parameters of this system are directly related to the characteristics of gravitational forces, mass, as well as the Earth's magnetic field. In other words, this hypothesis suggests that gravity and magnetism are directly related and thus by controlling magnetism, we can control gravity. We will return to this point later. And meanwhile, we will continue to study the connection between sound phenomena and gravity. Continuing the search for an answer to the question about the conditions that cancel the effects of gravity, we came across the work of another researcher who in his works mentioned the ability of sound vibrations to affect the very foundations of matter. John Ernst Worrell Keeley, 1837 to 1898. An American inventor believed that sound vibrations at a certain frequency could cause the ether to vibrate. By creating vibration, the ether can be concentrated and directed. As the ether is the foundation of all matter, any material objects can be controlled by this method. Keeley's most impressive achievement was the creation of an aircraft operating on this principle. By 1896, Keeley had improved his system to such an extent that he decided to demonstrate the aircraft to the United States Department of War. The experiment was conducted in an open space, under the observation of the Department of War and representatives of the media. The descriptions of the device indicate that it was a circular platform, approximately 1.8 meters in diameter. On this platform, in front of the keyboard, there was a small seat. The keyboard was attached to a large number of tuned resonating plates and vibration mechanisms. The control mechanism consisted of 100 vibration rods, representing an harmonic and diatonic scales. When half of the rods were blocked, the device could accelerate from 0 to 800 km per hour in just a few seconds. If all the rods were blocked, gravity would regain control and the device would descend to the ground. The weather conditions did not affect the device and it could ascend even during a thunderstorm or storm. Despite the impressive performance of the device, the Department of War informed Keeley that they saw no benefit in operating such a complex instrument and refused to consider the matter further. The most amazing thing about the device was that when Keeley was on the platform and activated it, he was not affected by acceleration effects at all. 
This suggests that an anti-gravity effect occurred during flight. The peculiarity of Keeley engines was that they only functioned in the presence of their inventor. This gave skeptics reason for doubt. However, the researchers believe that Keeley devices operated using psychic energy. If this is the case, in our investigation of candidates for gravity control, besides ether, sound, and electromagnetic resonance phenomena, there is another unknown factor, human consciousness. But Keeley went even further. He wasn't afraid to connect his theories with the idea of an primordial being. Keeley spoke of love as the universal force of the universe, expressed in the form of etheric force, ether again. Well, it seems that in search of conditions for the emergence of anti-gravity, we cannot do without it. The remarkable fact is that during the period when official science prohibited even mentioning of ether, at the same time, in the very Germany where the ban began in 1920, a group called Vril appeared, which was organized by a medium and contactee Maria Orsic. Orsic's group created an anti-gravity machine. We began to elaborate on this issue and realized that the use of Vril is another way of changing the conditions under which anti-gravity occurs. Maria Orsic is a well-known medium and contact team. In 1919, Orsic organized a team called Vril in Germany, consisting of other female mediums. During their meditative practices, according to them, they received information in the ancient Sumerian language from extraterrestrial beings from the Aldebaran system. As a result of these contacts, the Vril group accumulated a vast amount of valuable data, which was later used to build eight models of flying machines. The lifting force in them was created by rapidly rotating disks, which is why they had a shape of a bell as well as of a proverbial flying saucer. They could be controlled remotely from Earth only by a female pilot using Vril energy. First tests conducted by private investors in 1922 ended in failure as the flying machine was torn to pieces. The work continued and at the end of 1944, Engineers of the Third Reich successfully tested the seventh model with significantly improved design. The aircraft was in flight for 55 minutes, reaching a speed of 300,000 kilometers per hour. However, everyone was shocked upon its return. The ship's hull had aged as if hundreds of years had passed since its construction, and many of its components were damaged. Maria explained that it was a consequence of high speed. As they were years of the Second World War, the SS had a keen interest in the project as a new type of weapon. This made Maria sabotage the project. She claimed that there was a flaw in the design that needed to be fixed, after which the machine was sent to a hangar in Munich. Maria and the Vril team disappeared without a trace in Berlin in March 1945. There is a speculation that the eighth model of the aircraft Vril 8 was completed and the girls went on it to the Aldebaran system. Adding fuel to the fire is Maria's letter of March 11, 1945, which she sent to all members of the Thule Society, where she was working at the time. The letter ended with the words, nobody stays here. It seems that our arsenal of tools that can create conditions for the manifestation of anti-gravity has expanded to the power of real. To learn more about this force, which is called nothing else but the universal currency of the universe, you can watch the video 
with the participation of the esteemed Igor Mikhailovich Danilov. It would take the real society in particular. The information which they obtained, is it information that they bought from the system, or is it a connection with aliens? Certainly. Tatiana has just said the main thing. They bought this knowledge they retrieved, drawings and many other things, by paying for them with a lot and converting it into anti-a-lot. It is indeed a very valuable exchange fund, so to say. Or, what to call it more correctly? Well, it is actually the most valuable currency in the universe. Igor Mikhailovich, is this magic or not? No, it's not magic. Any magic is based on anti-a-lot, let's put it this way. But there is a tremendous difference. They worked in a group, using certain practices. The practices they used were Tibetan and Japanese. Let's say, they used techniques and methods from the Yellow Hats and the Green Dragon organizations in order to achieve this result. But if we translate all of this into finance, it would be as if they used two banks, so to say, in order to pay for what they received. Interesting. Thus, they paid with their lives for the information they received mm -hmm. in order to… There is another interesting point, Igor Mikhailovich. It's just that this real society, when they were actually practicing, let's say, when the group was working, the members of the real society had practices aimed at focusing attention. It is interesting that they were able to contemplate some leaf or a bud on a tree for a long time, or they even had to activate the vital force of a seed with the power of thought. Those are special techniques, mm -hmm. special techniques owing to which they were taught to properly invest their attention. Mm -hmm. This is interesting, indeed. All traces of the Orsage group and the results of its work ended in 1945. What's next? Where else can we find evidence of anti-gravity phenomena, or at least hints on how to create conditions under which these phenomena occur? We found a clue to the next step in the mention of correspondence between Maria Orsage and Nikola Tesla. Unfortunately, this correspondence is only mentioned and is still classified as secret, just like all of Tesla's other works on anti-gravity. However, we did manage to find out something. In 1911, the New York Herald Tribune newspaper published an interview with Tesla in which he stated, My flying machine will have neither wings nor propellers. You might see it on the ground, and you would never guess that it was a flying machine. Yet, it will be able to move at will through the air in any direction with perfect safety. The next evidence of Tesla's continued work in the field of anti-gravity came to us in records of a lecture he gave on May 12, 1938, at the Immigrant Charity Council. In this lecture, Tesla announced that he was working on the dynamical theory of gravity and would very soon give it to the world upon completing secret developments. The dynamical theory of gravity claimed to be a unified theory of everything, connecting all the types of interactions known today. William Lyne, an American scientific researcher of Tesla's biography and works, describes in his book Occult Ether Physics an absurd situation that arose around the dynamic theory of gravity. Tesla never published it in full. And after his death, all documents related to it were classified and are still held in government archives to this day. When William Lyne specifically requested these documents from the National Security Research Center, at Los Alamos National Laboratory in 1979, he was denied access. He was denied access. Notably, the availability of documents was recognized. The curious thing is that on the same day, William found a scheme of a hydrogen bomb in the public domain. What could be in Tesla's documents from 1943 that is more secret than the scheme of a hydrogen bomb? Further, William Lyne claims the following. 
Werner von Braun, a renowned German rocket and aerospace engineer, headed a series of secret projects on flying saucers based on electrogravitational effect, with the support of Nikola Tesla between 1934 and 1938. The projects had a codename P2. However, whether it's true or not remains unknown, as Nikola Tesla was known for his pacifist views and could not willingly hand over his most important developments to Nazi Germany. However, it is well known that Tesla officially advised the German company Telefunken, specializing in the production of radio equipment. His contacts with representatives of the company lasted for many years, starting from 1911. Another story shrouded in mystery is what happened to Nikola Tesla's safe. Sava Kasanovich, Tesla's nephew, arrived at his hotel room at the New Yorker the day after his death. While examining the contents of the safe in the room, he noticed to the present staff that some important documents and a black notebook with notes on a government project had disappeared. After that, the FBI wanted to arrest Kasanovich and tried to accuse him of breaking into the safe and stealing the documents. However, there were witnesses who confirmed that Tesla's nephew did not take any documents. Following this, the FBI took an explicable step. They refused to deal with Tesla's case altogether and handed it over to the Office of Foreign Property Management. All of Tesla's belongings were moved to a government storage facility, which was closed off from access. It is beyond doubt that the FBI was interested in Tesla's work, monitored him, and could not help but participate in examining his archives. Probably, FBI managed to do this before the arrival of Kasanovich in Tesla's room. This is almost all the information available today about Tesla's work directly in the anti-gravity field. However, some eyewitness accounts still remain, claiming to have seen his anti-gravity machine in flight. In the book Lost Science, Gary Vasilatos provides testimony from an eyewitness who confirms that Tesla used such technology. It is described as follows. Tesla was seen standing on a platform, surrounded by a purplish corona, some 30 feet above the ground. The contrivance had a small coil aft and was entirely covered underneath with a smooth surface of sheet copper. The platform was perhaps two feet in total depth, being cramped with components. Tesla strode over to the platform stood before a control panel and whisked aloft in a crown of white sparks. The excessive sparks subsided with increased distance from the ground, often arcing to metal fencing. Tesla went out of his way to avoid the numerous metallic wrench fencing beneath his aerial course. It was said that Tesla often delighted in soaring through the night air for hours each night. But the traces of Tesla's work in the field of anti-gravity do not end there. In 1925, he accidentally met Otis Carr. Tesla recognized a real engineer in this man and shared much with him. It is necessary to give credit to the foresight of Tesla because Otis, in those years, worked as a simple clerk in a hotel in Manhattan, where the world-famous inventor was staying. This acquaintance completely changed Carr's fate. Their friendship lasted until Nikola Tesla's death. In 1947, Otis Carr completed the development of a working, saucer-shaped spacecraft. By the late 1950s, he had built several other flying machines. According to Carr, any vehicle accelerated to an axis rotation relative to its attractive inertial mass, immediately becomes activated by free space energy and acts as an independent force. 
In 1959, car received US patent number 2,912,244 for the OTC-X1 spacecraft project, despite the fact that the US Patent Office had not recognized the idea of perpetual motion for many years, and car's device used exactly that principle. The patent was granted. Ralph Ring, a talented technician who worked with Carr on his flying machines, stressed that the key to understanding the principles of anti-gravity is working with nature. He insisted, resonance, you have to work with nature, not against her. He described, when the disks of the model were powered up to operational speed, an interesting effect occurred. The metal turned to jello. You could push your finger right into it. It ceased to be solid. It turned into another form of matter, which was as if it was not entirely here in this reality. It was uncanny, one of the weirdest sensations I've ever felt. However, as it usually happens with inventors whose discoveries could free humanity, in 1960, Carr was found guilty of selling unregistered stocks. In January, he was charged with fraud. And in 1961, agents of the intelligence services came to Carr. In an interview, Ralph Ring, who we already know, describes what happened in the following way. They came with their gadgets and said, Right now, you'll shut up. And when we asked why, they replied, because you would destroy the monetary system of the United States. That was the trick. And will confiscate everything. They burst into the offices and laboratory and began confiscating everything they could lay their hands on. Eventually, Otis Carr was sentenced to 14-year jail term and his laboratory was destroyed. The essence of a physical experiment is to question nature rather than dictate to it one's own even very clever and original opinion. Aid Mitriev. So we found out that the phenomena of electric and sound resonances can be used to create conditions that cancel the effect of gravity. Besides, human consciousness and the power of human attention can also create anti-gravity. But this is not the whole arsenal of means that we have discovered. Creating Artificial devices to reduce or completely redirect the forces of gravity on a local scale is possible if we look at the experience of nature in whirlwind tornadoes. There are cases when tornadoes sucked out wells of about 10 meters deep to the bottom. Lakes and swamps with all fauna and flora were completely drained. Small buildings and cattle were lifted and carried. All of this cannot be attributed to aerodynamics forces alone. It has been noted that upon these tornadoes generate strong electromagnetic fields, including microwave radio emission, which appears long before a thunderstorm forms. This very circumstance can serve as a basis for all anti-gravity devices. The electromagnetic field in the form of a funnel will stimulate a centrifugal etheric vortex leading to anti-gravity. This is what Leonid Ivanovich Ilchenko, a candidate of technical sciences, associate professor of the Far Eastern State Technical Fishery University of Vladivostok, writes in his work, Nature of the Gravitation, Inertia, Motion Planet. Vortices. What do we know about this phenomenon? Everyone has seen the white tracks high in the sky trailing behind airplane turbines. You could also observe the wake behind a ship while standing at its stern and how water vortices created by propellers raise the surface of the water or watch smoke rings emitted by a smoker. All of these are the examples of the vortex motion that is studied by aerodynamics. Aerodynamics is a science that solves serious problems. From the design of turbine blades, ship propeller blades, to the profiles of aircraft, ships and cars moving at high speed. A great number of scientists work in this field, 
but none of them has claimed about manifestations of anti-gravity in vortex phenomena, except for one man who wasn't a scientist, Austrian forester Victor Schauberger, observing the movement of water in streams, discovered extraordinary properties of water vortices and created many working devices based on this invention. Discoveries of Victor Schauberger, 1885 to 1958, could have given humanity completely new sources of energy. His work refuted some of the principles of hydrology, the postulates of evolutionism and Darwinism, and went far beyond what people knew about water. Observing nature, Schauberger built an engine that used the principle of atmospheric vortex. The first model required nothing but water to operate and was designed back in 1921. On August 14, 1936, in his diary, Schauberger wrote, I am faced with the possible emptiness, compressed, dematerialized space that we habitually call a vacuum. Now I understand that anything can be created from this nothing. A few people know about another unknown side of Schauberger's life, his work for the Third Reich. Hitler himself became interested in Schauberger's work and offered him cooperation for further developments. But the inventor refused, with sad consequences for himself. In 1938, he was declared wanted, caught, placed in a psychiatric hospital, and then transferred to the Third Reich laboratories. There, Schauberger created the Repulsin A engine, which exploded during testing, and the Repulsin B engine, which according to some reports was used in Nazi flying saucers. Schauberger described levitation technology as follows. If water or air is made to move cycloidally, spirally, under the influence of high frequency vibrations, this leads to the formation of a structure of energy or high-quality thin matter that levitates with incredible force, carrying the generator body along with it. After the war, Americans offered Schauberger $3 million to reveal the secret of his flying disc and especially his explosive engine. However, he replied that nothing could be disclosed until an international agreement on complete disarmament was signed and that his discovery belonged to the future. But the Americans didn't give up their attempts to find out the secret of his invention. On July 1, 1958, at the invitation of American partners, Victor Schauberger flew to Dallas. The project was supposed to be implemented in Texas with the support of a wealthy American financier. Schauberger's devices were supposed to be built in large factory workshops. However, this never happened. The equipment from Austria arrived two months late. Some of it was damaged and some of it disappeared. As a result, the Texas project ended up in nothing. What was the reason for this failure? Obviously, no one intended to have this project implemented. To top it all off, Schauberger was forced to sign a contract according to which he handed over all his ideas, patents and thoughts to an American consortium only to be able to go home. Victor Schauberger died five days after his return. In a letter written just before his death, Victor Schauberger bitterly noted, The whole of science and all its hangers-on are nothing but a band of thieves who are suspended like marionettes and must dance to whatever tune their well-camouflaged slave masters deem necessary. As we can see, the conditions in which we exist today desperately resist the idea of anti-gravity becoming widely used. Literally, every scientist who deals with issues beyond scientific dogma faces the obstacle of the official scientific and commercial environment. But today, the number of publications and actually working anti-gravity devices is growing like an avalanche. Obviously, the day when the dam of official bands of anti-gravity research will be broken is not far off. And this means that the dogmatic foundation erected at the Congress of German Natural Scientists in 1920 will have to be revised. 
But let's return to our study of the conditions in which the effect of anti-gravity occurs. Victor Schauberger discovered the effect which consists in the fact that a dense medium, be it air or water, in the process of its rotational motion along the cycloid creates invisible structures of energy or high-quality fine matter. The rotation of the medium. Maybe this is the main condition for the emergence of anti-gravity. John Roy Robert Searle was born on May 2, 1932, in Walthamstow, England. In the 1940s, he worked as an electrical engineer at Rewinds in London. While experimenting with magnetized rollers rolling on the surface of a ring magnet, John Searle noticed a voltage generated on the opposite ends of the rollers, even at relatively low speeds. He explained this potential difference by the rotation of free electrons. Searle wondered how to collect these free electrons, and he got the answer in a recurring dream, an image of a magical square. Once Searle realized that this was the principle of magnet placement in his device, he decided to create a device based on this principle. He secured permission to use the capacity and technical resources of the company to produce it. When all the magnetic components were made, he assembled his first generator. It happened in December 1946. Robert named it SEG, which stands for Searle Effect Generator. In 1952, following the same principle, Searle created an electric generator with a 90 cm diameter and a single row of rolling magnets. The rollers were rotated using a small electric motor. During testing the device, Searle and his colleagues were shocked by the result. Once the generator gained speed, it detached from the drive motor and soared to 15 meters above the ground. The disc maintained its altitude while gaining speed. A pink, ionized airglow appeared around it. At the same time, all nearby radios stopped receiving signals. Then the generator rapidly flew into the sky and disappeared in an unknown direction. Over time, Searle built and tested several different devices of this kind, including a multi-row generator with a 9-meter diameter. In these machines, the anti-gravity effect was so powerful and uncontrollable that many prototypes were simply lost. They left their mark on the ground in the form of suddenly appearing large clear holes. In these places, part of the ground lifted up together with the device. If the disc hovered over the ground for too long, the soil got burned due to the electric currents emanating from the generator. When people or animals approached the device too closely, they could feel an ionizing discharge. Between 1950 and 1952, John Searle created and tested over a dozen models of levitating discs. With time, he learned how to control their acceleration. In 1963, being confident in the novelty of his discoveries, Searle sent invitations to the royal house and top government officials for the presentation of his flying saucer model. However, no one responded to the invitation. Then, in 1967, he turned to English scientists, but they only ridiculed the uneducated electrician. As the saying goes, no profit is acceptable in his own country. Despite the dismissive attitude from official institutions, information about Searle's amazing devices spread widely throughout the country. BBC journalists even made a documentary about it, which was shown on TV. However, the local electricity committee later accused John Searle of stealing electricity. The electricians refused to believe that his laboratory was powered by its own source. The scientist was sentenced to 10 months in prison. During this time, a strange fire broke out in the laboratory. But even before the fire, all equipment, drawings and mysterious inventions had disappeared. His wife also left him.
In 1983, at the age of 51, John Searle was released from prison completely bankrupt. He managed to endure everything and have a fresh start. Perhaps the resilience he gained in childhood stood him in good stead. Just four years later, he found like-minded people again. Searle gradually resumed his research and began to travel the world with lectures. The Searle SEG Magnetics Company is currently actively working in California. On their website, you can find a concept for a compact device with 15 kilowatt. The device is quite complex and consists of 2,124 components. The basis of the device is three stator rings and 66 sets of rollers. Thanks to the active work of John Searle, our piggy bank of ways to change the conditions under which anti-gravity manifests itself has been refilled with another one, rotating magnets. In my lifetime, I have told my secrets to more than a million people. I wonder why they don't want to hear. This is how Searle spoke about many years of activity to promote his anti-gravity fuel-free generators. Is this really true? that no one in the scientific community is interested in these extraordinary devices that violate every conceivable laws of physics. Searle was heard by Russian physicists Vladimir Roshchin and Sergei Godin, and they didn't only hear, but wanted to understand and repeat this amazing device. For this purpose, they organized a personal meeting with Searle. However, Searle did not reveal the specific features of his device. Having returned to their homeland, Roshchin and Godin decided to do everything on their own. In 1990, a group of scientific researchers from Moscow Aviation Institute established a laboratory of technical physics in the Meshprom Project Institute. The research was financed by private investors and conducted in close collaboration with Moscow Aviation Institute under the Department of Electrical, Electromechanical and Biotechnical Systems. Roshin and Godin named their project Astra. By 1990, a theory had already been developed about the quantum environment in which electromagnetism and gravity are formed. This theory could explain the phenomena occurring in Searle's devices. Practical testing of this theory was needed. The experimental installation was created by the middle of 1993. Vladimir Roshin and Sergei Godin called it an electromagnetic converter. The converter was a stationary stator, around which a rotor with magnetic rollers attached to it would rotate. The diameter of the magnetic system of the working body of the converter was 1 meter. The mass of the installation was 350 kg. It was fixed on a movable platform along with an accelerating engine, and coils for extracting useful electric energy were placed around the periphery. Several electric lamps, each with a power of 1 kilowatt, were used as a load. The installation produced a series of results that did not fit into contemporary scientific understandings. Particularly impressive was its weight reduction by 50% and this was at the mass of 350 kilograms. The thrust vector depended on the direction of rotation. When rotating clockwise, a thrust against gravity was generated and the installation lost weight. When rotating counterclockwise, the weight conversely increased. According to the creators of the installation, at speeds exceeding 500 revolutions per minute, self-rotation began. This means that the machine no longer consumed energy. In fact, it had to be actively braked to prevent it from going out of control. To achieve this, the rotor was switched to a generator with a load of up to 7 kW, which caused braking. When the machine operated in a dimly lit room, a coronal discharge in the form of a bluish-pink glow and a distinctive ozone smell were observed around it. Another anomaly was the appearance of peculiar vertical magnetic walls around the installation, extending up to a distance of 15 meters. They represented areas of intensified magnetic field, inside which the air temperature decreased by 8 degrees. The distance between adjacent walls was 50 to 60 centimeters, and their thickness ranged from 5 to 8 centimeters. 
These effects began to manifest at 200 revolutions per minute and increased linearly as the number of revolutions grew. There is an opinion that the decrease in temperature was due to the adiabatic drop in air pressure caused by the reduction in gravity between air molecules inside the magnetic walls. The experiments were conducted for a short time until the laboratory was closed in the autumn of 1993 due to the financial problems of investors. This led to the loss of the laboratory's premises and the destruction of the installation. From 1993 to 1999, Roshan and Godin made attempts to find financing for the reconstruction of the laboratory installation in various governmental structures, from the Academy of Sciences to the Security Council. However, there was no understanding or support shown. Obviously, in the experiments with their device, Roshchin and Godin stepped into terra incognita. Under the influence of rotating disk with magnets, the properties of the space in which the experiments took place changed. The rotational motion and magnetic field somehow changed the conditions and anti-gravity emerged. We can say that the very structure of our space interacts with rotating magnetic fields. Otis Carr, John Searle, Roshchin and Godin were not alone in their search. A group of scientists led by Alexander Berezhny faced a similar phenomenon. They spun a metallic disc. At a certain speed, a similar effect appeared. The spinning disc affected gravity. The scientists called this effect cortege. The anomalous weight loss effect was predicted and experimentally confirmed in 2003 by Alexander Borisovich Berezhnoy, a candidate of technical sciences and the head of the laboratory. Berezhnoy called this effect cortege, which in Russian stands for short-circuited toroidal electronic tourniquet. This effect manifests when a metallic disc is accelerated to a high rotational speed with constant acceleration. At a certain point, an annular arc discharge is lit around its entire perimeter. It looks like a luminous plasma vortex that detaches from the surface of the disc and begins to exist on its own. This is accompanied by a surge in the magnetic field around the installation, which releases a large amount of energy and causes weight loss up to levitation. The first results gave an impressive lifting force of 10 kilograms. In the subsequent experiments in 2005, they used a disc made of fiberglass with a double-sided coating of a high-temperature superconductor, yttrium-barium-copper oxide. Tychondes are titanium-containing ceramic materials. They are used in high-frequency capacitors. Notable tychondes are rutile, perovskite, and strontium titanate. Under normal conditions, to achieve the effect, a significant rotational speed is required, almost reaching the point of disk destruction. That's about half a million revolutions per minute. However, thanks to a series of technical solutions, the author managed to reduce it to an acceptable 7,000 revolutions per minute. One of these solutions is cooling the disk. The lower its temperature, the lower the required rotational speed to ignite the plasma vortex and create the anti-gravity thrust. Installations based on this principle can be used as propulsion systems on any aircraft without requiring a single gram of fuel. In fact, it is the same fuel-free generator. Moreover, the specific energy capacity of such a machine is simply astonishing. A generator based on the cortege effect weighing just one kilogram can provide an output power of one megawatt. Despite multiple experimental confirmations of the effect, the applications submitted for the opening were refused. Then, the project was strongly opposed at the stage of searching for an investor. In 2005, a scientific testing facility built at the expense of the participants was seized from the team. The more we studied this question, 
the more it became clear. Rotational motion changes the properties of space, affects its structure at a fundamental level. Thus, we got even closer to understanding the structure of matter, which means that the keys to complete control over inanimate nature may soon be in our hands. But, as always in the consumerist format, the scenario of events around revolutionary discoveries is approximately the same. First, opposition and discreditation, then ignorance and silence, and eventually forgetting. Just imagine, you have a 1 megawatt generator on your desk. For comparison, the socket in your flat produces 200 times less power. Alexander Berezhnoi discovered the Cortez effect at room temperature. The disk entered the state of superconductivity with generation of a super strong magnetic field and anti-gravity thrust. The list of researchers who encountered the manifestation of anti-gravity when studying rotating disks in a magnetic field does not end here. Ten years before Berezhnoi, anti-gravity was accidentally discovered by researchers from Yevgeny Podklentny's group due to the smoking habits of employees. In 1992, a Russian scientist Eugene Podkletnov, who worked at the Tampere University in Finland, accidentally discovered an unusual gravitational shielding effect. Later, this effect was given his name. On that fateful day, Butkletnov was working on a device with a superconductive disk rotating in a magnetic field at ultra-low temperatures. The disk was cooled with liquid nitrogen. One day, as one of his colleagues lit up a cigarette in the lab, releasing smoke, Eugene noticed that the smoke above the rotating disk took on the shape of a vertical column. Examining the nature of this phenomenon, he found that the test load positioned above the installation lost 2% of its weight. This very pattern persisted within the column, even when weights were lifted several floors above. The anti-gravity effect was carefully studied and verified by physicists. An article with the results of these studies was accepted by a reputable English journal. However, prior to its publication, the work received an extremely negative response from the scientific community, being labeled as questionable sensationalism. Furthermore, they failed to reproduce the effect in other labs around the world for a long time because the device lacked one critical component, a superconductive ceramic disc with a sufficiently large 12-inch diameter and a specific chemical composition, yttrium-barium-copper oxide. However, despite skepticism in scientific circles, Patletnev's discovery aroused keen interest at NASA, where collaboration was already underway with Chinese-American researcher Ning Li from the University of Alabama. Separately from the Russian scientist, Ning Li also presented results indicating the potential creation of a gravitational field capable of repelling or attracting matter using rapidly rotating superconductors. From the mid-1990s onward, NASA established an entirely official and transparent research unit called Breakthrough Propulsion Physics Program, which, among other anti-gravity research, is currently working on accurately replicating Patkletnev's work. There is another interesting fact. In 2000, the British, specifically the Project Greenlow Research Unit by British Aerospace Systems, announced funding of a similar anti-gravity project. But Kletnev achieved his best results by changing the speed of the disk rotation. Berezhnoi also mentions the need for acceleration. This once again confirms the fact this effect does exist. Subsequently, Eugene Patkletnev conducted many other experiments on anti-gravity. One of them simply has no analogues in the world in terms of its significance. Another creation by Patkletnev was a device without moving components. It was called an impulse gravity generator. During this experiment, a discharge of 1 million volts hit the target from a superconductor. 
This spawned a gravitational disturbance wave along the discharge line, spreading over a huge distance with practically no losses. Its impact was so powerful that it destroyed a brick wall at a distance of more than one kilometer. The work on such generators continues today in several countries. For example, Boeing Company reported in an article dated August 1, 2002, in Rocket Science magazine, that at a discharge of 2 megavolts, the target receives a hit with a force of 1 kilogram. Despite the fact that Boeing officially aims this research at finding anti-gravity thrust for its aircraft, one should not be surprised if the military one day has a weapon based on this principle. In the consumerist format, it cannot be otherwise. Any advanced technology always goes first to the military. People in the consumerist format are expendable. That is why it is very good that these technologies are closed Otherwise, it is better not to even think about it. But let's return to these fascinating experiments. If you have noticed, there are no moving parts in Podklentov's impulse gravity generator. The shock wave in it arises from the impact of a powerful and sharp high voltage impulse on the ether. Thus, we've got another tool to change the conditions in which anti-gravity manifests itself. In this case, the conditions are being changed by means of shock electromagnetic impulses. Potklento and Boeing are not alone in their search in this direction. Let's talk about another scientist with a tragic fate who embarked on the path of studying anti-gravity. Academician Gennady Fyodorovich Ignatiev, 1928-2000, the chief designer at the Geophysics Central Design Bureau and the state prize winner spent his last years teaching physics at Krasnoyarsk University, where he created his own laboratory. According to Ignatiev, he managed to reproduce almost all of Nikola Tesla's experiments. Gennady Fyodorovich became known in scientific circles for discovering the ponderomotive effect and developing a special engine for a ponderomotive aircraft, a spacecraft that uses the interaction of electromagnetic and gravitational forces to fly in space. However, Ignatiev himself claimed that this effect had already been described in the works of academician Igor Evgenievich Tam, a member of the USSR Academy of Sciences and a Nobel Prize winner. In 1996, shortly before his death, Ignatiev published a report on an experimental engine he had created with a thrust force of 60 newtons. It was a system of four oscillating circuits that created a rotating electromagnetic field. It resembled four Tesla coils combined into a system in the form of an equilateral cross with a size of 4 by 4 meters. The principle of the rotating field in the engine was implemented not through physical rotation, but by shifting the face of the fields generated by each of the four coils. They operated at a frequency of 80 kHz. In the same year of 1996, Mr. Ignatiev constructed a prototype of a 40-meter aircraft with a lifting force of more than 300 kg. In his opinion, this engine could be used in spacecraft capable of reaching very high speeds in the future and moving without using traditional fuel combustion. In theory, it could reach the speed of light. Those around Ignatiev knew him as a strong-willed, ambitious person who was difficult to stop or divert from his path. But at the end of his life, he suffered a personal tragedy, the loss of two children. His daughter, a staff member at one of the scientific institutes in Novosibirsk, actively helped him. She tragically died under mysterious circumstances while transporting her father's documents from Novosibirsk to Moscow. She froze to death in her own car. Unexpectedly, in August 1992, the scientist's son committed suicide.
In addition to all this, by 1993, the professor had been dismissed from all his positions. He sent letters requesting justice and help with funding his scientific research, but received no response. Leaving his design bureau and the absence of funding for his bold engineering ideas became fatal for him. He suffered a second stroke. As you can see, in the consumerist format of society, scientists who make brilliant discoveries find themselves on the sidelines of official science. The flywheel of dogmatic physics greens dissenters into dust. Our next hero was luckier. Issues of gravity occupied the minds of not only professional physicists, but even entomologists, such as the famous Viktor Stepanovich Grebenikov. Paradoxically today, Grebenikov is known not only as a scientist who made a significant scientific contribution to the study of insects and wrote more than 150 scientific papers, but also as the inventor of the anti-gravity platform. This anti-gravity platform has intrigued self-taught inventors for more than 20 years. Some claim to have already created his replica, while others continue to study Grebenikov's work in the hope of unrevealing the secret of the effect of cavity structures discovered by him, which is the basis of the anti-gravity machine. Viktor Stepanovich Grebennikov (1927–2001) was a Russian entomologist and apiarist, animalist artist, specialist in breeding and protecting insects, and writer. He was an honored ecologist of Russia, a member of the International Association of Bee Researchers, as well as a member of the Social Ecological Union and the Siberian Environmental Fund. Grebennikov became acquainted with the phenomenon of cavity structures through wild halicted bees. Once, in 1983, during field research, he attempted to spend the night in the steppe above a clay cliff riddled with burrows of these large bees, each with multiple passages and chambers. However, he couldn't fall asleep due to an increased heartbeat, flashes in his eyes, and a metallic taste in his mouth, which appeared out of nowhere. These unpleasant sensations disappeared once he moved five meters away from the underground bee city. From this, Grebennikov understood that it was the bee habitats that were the source of this impact. Bringing home several old bee nests with cells, Viktor Stepanovich placed them in a bowl. When he brought his hand close to them, he felt an unusual warmth. When he leaned over, he felt the same sensation he had felt above the bee city in the steppe, the impact of an unknown field. Further experiments by Grebennikov revealed that not only natural honeycombs, but also artificial cavity structures made from plastic, paper, metal and wood have a similar effect. Its force varies depending on the sizes, shapes, number and arrangement of cavities. While observing a bumblebee that accurately found the location of its nest, even through a wall, Grebennikov discovered that the cavity structure effect CSE is not blocked or shielded by anything. Similar to gravity, it impacts living beings through trees, metal and other obstacles. Since Viktor Stepanovich did not have a special education, he didn't devote much attention in his books to explain the phenomenon of the cavity structure effect CSE. However, Doctor of Physical and Mathematical Sciences Professor Valentin Fyodorovich Zolotarev tried to do this, publishing several articles jointly with Grebennikov. According to Zolotarev's hypothesis, the cause of the cavity structure effect CSE is so-called matter waves generated by any material object. The term matter waves was introduced in 1924 by French physicist Louis de Broglie, one of the founders of quantum mechanics, who proved that matter is not only particles, but also waves. Zolotarev believed that the coordinated movement of electrons in a cavity structure, such as a tube, generates matter waves of de Broglie. In this case, the tube's cavity becomes a resonator 
a powerful source of standing matter waves created in the direction of the tube axis. The story did not end with beacombs. The most interesting part began in 1988, when Grebennikov discovered a strange phenomenon manifested by partial invisibility and levitation of the chitinous covers of a beetle, whose order he didn't disclose. As Grebennikov described in his book My World, based on this phenomenon, he managed to construct an anti-gravity platform and develop principles for its control to achieve physical flight. Nikola Tesla once said, I no longer work for the present, I now work for the future. Probably Grebennikov decided to do the same, having written such a controversial letter to his friend Yuri Nikolaevich Cherednichenko at the end of his life. There he admits that he did not invent the gravity plane. Perhaps he just wanted to protect himself and his family, leaving all the secrets in his books to future generations in the form of encrypted messages. Who knows, maybe the study of the effect of cavity structures will lead scientists to new discoveries in the field of physics. As they write on the internet, in one of the design bureaus hangs a framed photograph of a May beetle in a frame, under which it is written, the May beetle flies violating all the laws of the aerodynamics, but it does not know about it and continues to fly. So a new principle has been added to our piggy bank of principles of anti-gravity devices, cavity spatial structures. But this is not all that we managed to discover in this mysterious area for modern researchers. Our search continues. The next hero was inspired not by bees at all. He tried to penetrate into the deepest depth of matter and he ended up discovering the same anti-gravity. On March 3, 2018, an experimental quantum engine without the ejection of reactive mass was presented to an authoritative commission. The commission that observed the tests included Doctor of Technical Sciences Professor Georgi Kostin, member of the Expert Council of the Defense Committee of the State Duma, Lieutenant General Mikhail Sautin, and Alexander Kubasov, an esteemed spacecraft test pilot from the Rocket and Space Corporation Energy, along with many other highly respected researchers and scientists. The results stunned the audience. The prototype developed a thrust force of approximately 115 newtons per kilowatt. For comparison, the best examples of modern rocket technology are unable to produce a thrust force exceeding 0.7 newtons per kilowatt. This means that the device presented to the Commission operates 165 times more efficiently than the reactive engine used in the contemporary space industry. The author of this unique engine is Vladimir Semyonovich Leonov, an academician of the International Academy of Systems Research. Leonov's engine is based on his theory of space-time. He says, We have found that enormous energy is spilled through outer space in the form of a global electromagnetic field with very fine discretization, which was previously unknown. I discovered this global field in 1996 as the fifth fundamental force in the form of a super-strong electromagnetic interaction. Its carrier is the quantum of space-time, the quantum, whose size is 10 orders of magnitude smaller than an atomic nucleus, but it concentrates energy far exceeding the nuclear energy. Based on this theory, the so-called dark energy or physical vacuum that forms space is a manifestation of the forceful elastic energy grid. The thrust force in Leonov's devices arises as a result of the repulsion of the working bodies of the engine from this energy grid. In other words, due to the appearance of the force of artificial gravity or anti-gravity, the device creates an impulsive movement without ejection of mass. To start the engine and enter the operational mode, it is necessary to provide it with electrical power. But even considering these expenses, Leonov's engine is nearly 200 times more efficient than existing jet analogs.
Although the experimental model of Leonov's quantum engine was showcased in 2014 at the Russian Academy of Sciences and was recognized as operational, the brilliant scientist was accused of charlatanism and falsification of results. He was not allocated funds to continue his research. The closer the scientist got to the truth, the stronger the resistance became. To legislatively consolidate the fight against scientists like Leonov, in 1998, at the initiative of Doctor of Physical and Mathematical Sciences Vitaly Ginsburg, a committee was established to combat pseudoscience. Leonov had a conflict with this committee. In essence, the controversy arose not between Ginsburg and Leonov, but between the physics of the 20th century, represented by Ginsburg, and the physics of the 21st century. Not wanting to go beyond established dogmas, Ginsburg did not consider Leonov's work and responded that he was unlikely to find support within the scientific community. The motives for such a response were aptly noted in a letter from Leonov to Ginsburg. You believe that the main work in physics has already been done and all that remains is to dust off your works. Forget about this. The physics to which you dedicated your life no longer exists. It has remained in history. The physics of the 20th century is the physics of closed quantum mechanical systems that simply do not exist in nature. Vladimir Leonov passed all the hardships with honor. The Committee on Pseudoscience could not present evidence of the inefficiency of Leonov's invention. Today, this remarkable scientist, laureate of the prize of the Russian government, is called the father of the theory of non-jet movement in space vacuum. Yes, the time for physics of the 21st century has come. Theoretical developments say that Leonov's quantum engines could play a crucial role in the development of astronautics. At 1000 km per second, and the solar system stops being so huge. Three and a half hours to the Moon, 40 with little hours to the Mars. Exciting, isn't it? And further, it will become possible to travel cosmic distances in several minutes. This is possible already today, we just need to change the conditions. However, it is not enough to provide conditions from the technical side. They have also to be created for scientists so that they can work peacefully and efficiently without harassment and persecution from the committees for dealing with pseudoscience and similar structures. This impressive list of scientists and inventors who have dealt with the nature of gravity could be continued for a very long time. Ivan Posvenchuk, Thomas Townsend Brown, Alexander Frollo, Spartak Polyakov, Floyd Swede, Nikolai Kozirev, Maurice Alley, Valery Menshiko, Bruce De Palma, Carl Schapeler, Dewey Larson, John Nordberg, Alexander Dmitriev, William Cooper, Ivan Shaparono, Albert Victor Bainik, and many, many others. Where are the results of their work now? Does anyone know about them or have they been implemented somewhere in our life? On the contrary, traditional energy sources and means of transport continue to be defended and imposed all over the world. Each country has its own way of opposing progressive inventions. In Russia, it is the Committee on Pseudoscience of the Russian Academy of Sciences. In the West, they are transnational corporations. The result of their extensive activities is always the same. Its reason is simple. The hunger for power and money of a narrow circle of people. In other words, the consumer is format in all its glory. Everyone of us flew like a bird, else sticks 
is my the reason we're completely ignored Time and space just derivative like a toy Something is primal, it's information World's made of science, it's fractal Micro says the structure for all the macro Gravity's essence of all the reason in fact Quantum world's not a boundary direction It's no divination, no misconceptions Reasonable targets, play objectives Future science moves heavenly Boots, if we start the snake theory It's a world of particles, and these particles interact with each other, not only in our world, but also in the whole universe. Because any particle is a part of the whole. The question is, how all particles in the universe exchange information, how this global superluminal information network is organized? These are the questions we came to in the end. All great discoveries were made when people observed natural processes which are essentially particle flows, just as waves, whirlpools, and vortices can occur in the flow of water. So it happens with electromagnetic waves. Observing the elements has led to remarkable discoveries of many people, including Canadian engineer and inventor John Hutchinson. John Hutchinson, born in 1939, is a Canadian engineer and inventor who tried to repeat many of Nikola Tesla's experiments. In 1979, while studying longitudinal electromagnetic waves, Hutchinson accidentally made a shocking discovery, achieving a strange effect that was later named after him. The Hutchinson effect occurs as a result of the interference of longitudinal waves in a certain area of space generated by sources of high voltage, usually using two or more Tesla coils. Hutchinson very carefully studied the works of Nikola Tesla, striving to recreate the prototype of his laboratory with maximum accuracy and repeat his experiments. The result of his work was several successful repetitions of Tesla's experiments, but history remembered his name not for this. Truly remarkable was the Hutchinson effect itself, which many physicists still can't comprehend and explain. It is only known that strange phenomena occurred in the presence of several Tesla coils with a sufficiently high voltage. Since experiments by other scientists did not lead to the desired result, there is an opinion about the interaction of electromagnetic fields with other, yet unexplored forces and phenomena. The produced effects includes levitation of heavy objects, fusion of dissimilar materials such as metal and wood, anomalous heating of metals in the absence of burning substances nearby, Spontaneous rupture of metallic objects, which crack and spread in different directions. 
Scientists perceive the Hutchinson effect not as one, but as several overlapping phenomena, as a result of which different objects under the influence of electromagnetic waves behaved quite unexpectedly. Several large and sturdy pieces of metal were torn apart as if they were made of soft plastic. Heavy and bulky objects detached from surfaces and lifted into the air. Some metal pieces heated up nearly to their melting point without an additional source of heat, while others fused with wood, which is difficult to explain from a scientific perspective. How is this possible? And are there any modern scientific hypotheses that can explain all these amazing phenomena? In our opinion, clarity can be brought with the help of the theory of snakes, which was presented at the International Online Forum on April 22, 2023. Global crisis, there is a way out. If this hypothesis is true, time and research of scientists will show in the near future. According to this hypothesis, the pre-quantum state of matter is presented by short elastic waves of specific energies. We are in a constant stream of energies that can be represented as snakes in a linear state, while visible matter can be represented as snakes in a coiled state, in tangles. Regarding physics, there are several important laws. Change conditions and everything will change. Energy of a certain type can only be affected by energy of the same type. Small impact leads to big changes. We'll try to explain the results obtained by Hutchinson in his experiments using the hypothesis of snakes. Let's consider an example of splicing two foreign materials, metal and wood, into a single unit. According to the theory of snakes, all energies consist of linear forms of snakes, while the visible form of matter is composed of coiled states of those very snakes. What did Hutchinson do? He changed conditions, and the snakes, which were in coiled states in both metal and wood, began to straight and intertwine with each other. And when Hutchinson returned the external conditions to their original state, the snakes started to coil back up, returning to their previous state, intertwining with each other. As a result, there was a penetration of metal fragments into wood and wood fragments into metal as if they were originally fused. But not only that, at the place of penetration of materials into each other, new substances, perhaps not yet known to science, are born. The same picture is in the descriptions of Ralph Ring, in which he says that in Otis Carr's experiments, metal became as liquid as water and you could immerse your hand in it. Perhaps a similar phenomenon of matter mixing was observed in the Philadelphia experiment conducted in 1943. On the official website of the US Navy, the conduct of this experiment is refuted. But as the saying goes, there is no smoke without fire. Information about the Philadelphia experiment first became known thanks to astrophysicist, mathematician, and ufologist Morris Ketchum Jessup from Iowa. After the publication of his book, The Case for the UFO, in 1955, Jessup began receiving letters from a certain Mr. Carlos Miguel Allende, who claimed that the U.S. military, using secret technology in practice, could, paradoxically, move objects outside the usual space and time. Jessup began investigating and found a lot of evidence that the experiment did take place. But as often happens in such stories, on April 20th, 1959, Morris was found in his own car, suffocated from exhaust fumes. After his death, his friends and co-authors Ivan Sanderson and Dr. Manson Valentine continued investigating. And in 1979, William Moore and Charles Berlitz wrote a book, The Philadelphia Experiment, Project Invisibility, which used the information and findings from the investigation of Jessup and the Allende letters. The experiment took place on October 28, 1943, in the Pacific Ocean, abroad USS Eldridge, DE-173, 
with a length of 306 feet and a displacement of 1,260 tons. When the generators were activated, the ship disappeared. It is believed that at the time of the experiment, 181 people were on board. When the generators were turned off, the observers witnessed something terrible. Most of the ship's crew died, while the bodies of some sailors were literally imprinted into the ship's hull. Several dozens of people disappeared. The survivors were severely burned and close to insanity. Roughly around 20 people were relatively uninjured. And an interesting detail is that everyone's watches were lagging behind the real time. The military was shocked by what had happened. They halted the experiment, classified it, and the details of this experiment are still unknown. Tesla had developed this technology earlier, but categorically refused to conduct experiments on people, while the military was precisely interested in such experiments. Tesla ceased to suit and benefit them. The experiment took place in 1943. Strangely enough, in that very year, Tesla passed away. Based on the theory of snakes, we can suppose that the same effect occurred as in Hutchinson's experiment. Conditions changed, coiled snakes began to disintegrate, take a linear form and mix, and when the impact stopped, snakes started coiling back into tangles and acquiring the form of matter. When snakes are in the coiled state, we observe a particle. When under certain conditions, the tangle unravels and snakes align linearly, we observe a wave, meaning a wave state of the same particle. In essence, a coiled tangle is a quantum level of manifestation of a particle. While short elastic waves, snakes, of which everything consists, are beyond quantum level. There are many kinds of energies, or snakes, in the beyond quantum world. You can imagine them associatively with distinct patterns, colors, and thicknesses. Some are poisonous, while others are not. All the waves known to science today, electromagnetic, thermal, and so on, are comprised of combinations of these energies, or short elastic waves, snakes. In other words, any wave is discrete in its true nature, because it consists of many short elastic waves, snakes. No snake ever disappears. They simply transition from one state to another. Likewise, all material objects are composed of these coiled snakes as the tiniest material particles. Each snake in a coil carries a specific piece of information, a code. Depending on the combination of snakes within a particle, different types of matter with designated properties manifest in the material world. The characteristics of a material object and all the processes occurring in it are formed at the beyond quantum level. In other words, the information embedded in particles at the beyond quantum level determines what these particles form, living or non-living matter, for instance, a dog or a ball. Another interesting phenomenon observed in Hutchinson's experiments was anti-gravitational anomalies. For instance, a steel core could rise and hover in the air, while smaller objects even flew upwards. Let's explore this from the perspective of the theory of snakes. Imagine that everything around us is permeated by streams of snakes in a linear state. Most of these flows are unidirectional in our area of space. It can be compared to the flow of a river. What is anti-gravity? From the perspective of the theory of snakes, anti-gravity can be compared to redirecting the flow of this river. By changing conditions, we intervene in the flow, inducing its local slowdowns, vortices, counterflows, and waves, which means that we get complete control over the matter. Igor Mikhailovich, you've said that the core is the center of gravity. Definitely. The point is that some scientific minds say, does gravity exist at all? Maybe we should abandon such a concept as gravity forces and be guided only by centrifugal forces, especially in outer space. You know, this sounds very funny, in fact. 
Although, I want to tell you the following. Modern science, including physics, is more of a philosophical section. Why? Because it is possible to prove and disprove anything. In fact, this is true, friends. The only thing that is accurate is mathematics. Here, if there is one, then it is one. If one plus one, then it is two, you see? Somehow you cannot twist that, although they are also trying to manipulate it. So, going back to our gravity and centrifugal forces, centrifugal forces have their relevance only in a gravitational field. If we remove the gravitational component, centrifugal forces cease to exist. We have the so-called gravitational field everywhere across the universe, which allows the entire material world to interact with each other. A simple example. On your beautiful hairstyle, there are particles on the tip of your hair. So, just for you to know, the tip of your hair is interacting right now with the most distant galaxy. And not just with the most distant galaxy, but with every grain of sand in that galaxy. Moreover, with all the galaxies. And now, I will also say something seditious, excuse me, but this is true. So, the tip of your hair contains all the information about any particle in the farthest galaxy and its current state. Why? Because any part of a hologram contains information about the whole hologram. If we proceed from the laws of fractals, then this is true. If we proceed from the laws of gravitational interaction, I mean, the exchange of information, then this is true. You see how it all turns out. Can we prove it? Well, that's difficult. Can we refute it? With the help of modern physics, the one we use, it is easy. It can be refuted. But, and here we come to the quantum world, which exactly confirms what I said. But it is complex. And those laws which are fundamental and indisputable for us, they absolutely do not work at the level of the quantum world. Well, this is, let's say, the funniest thing in this situation. Why? Because the laws of the quantum world absolutely do not work beyond the quantum limit, where everything originates. In actual fact, everything does not originate beyond the quantum limit. But if we go deeper into this process of reduction, that's where everything material originates. At the moment, snakes is just a hypothesis. It may seem naive to some people today, but just imagine what will happen in the near future when we learn to create conditions in which snakes change their state in a controlled way. In fact, through this theory, we will get complete control over matter. Yes, it will be time when science fiction becomes reality fuel-free generators, FFGs, anti-gravity thrust engines, matter replicators and recyclers, health capsules, and most importantly, stabilization of the planet's core to prevent global climate catastrophes. As we can see, now science has almost everything that is necessary, not only to save humanity, but also for its long, happy life. Only one, the most important thing is missing, is the creative society. That's it for now. You probably have questions. If you've managed to watch it this far, you couldn't not have them, because even we have questions. Let's get to the bottom of them together. Please write to us at the email address shown on the screen. Only through joint efforts can we uncover the truth. See you soon.